Everyone, take your seat. Warm welcome in our beautiful reading room and uh, to our first vice president, Rob Marcaras, and to the authors, our panelists today. Welcome also to our audience online, since we are on WebEx and on WebStream. On WebStream. So this event on the 10 issues to watch is uh, now a traditional uh, event of the EPRS. It's the eighth time, believe it or not, that we do it. It's an event to launch the year, a year of research for policy making. The 10 issues we are exploring in this publication are the result of a collective thinking at the end of last year, where policy unit did brainstorm together and came with suggestion. It's also a selection. So we explore issues that are obvious, Ukraine war, still going on, climate change, US and European elections, and other issues that are, for, uh, that are at first glance less prevailing, such as the rise of India or the future of the automotive sector in Europe. But these issues we consider of growing relevance and that consider that they deserve attention. We are aware that some issues are not covered. Let's look at the question of international justice, core crimes, and the reparation of the rights of victims. There are proceedings going on in Ukraine for uh, what I mentioned here, these core crimes, despite, and this procedure advancing despite a continuing war. But there are also other places of conflict. We think, of course, of the Hamas-Israel war, but we can think also about the last year uh, issue in Nagorno-Karabakh. So keep in mind that this exercise of the 10 issues to watch is to be seen in a wider context of the numerous work activities that we have, numerous research, about 800 publications in support for policymaking last year, and that we are covering a very wide range of issues. So we have one and a half hour for this event. I already invite uh, you to think about questions because after the presentation, we'll have questions. And I invite also the audience online to use the chat opportunity. But before moving to the presentation by the authors, I would like to invite uh, our first vice president, Otmar Kahas, for a remark of introduction. He's well known in this house. Mr. Kahas has been member of the parliament since to, uh, 1999, quite a long time. He's a member for Austria and member of the EPP group. And in the Bureau of the Parliament, which is the gatherings of the President and the Vice Presidents, the first Vice President is responsible in Alia for information and communication policy for EPRS, the Member's Research Service, but also the Library, and relations with NATO, OSC, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund. So thank you very much, Vice President Karas, for being with us today to show the support that you have always given to the work of the EPRS and the analyst. Over to you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, meine Damen und Herren, liebe Freundinnen und Freunde des EPRS, dear Director General and Deputy Secretary General of the European Parliament, Cher Etienne, welcome to our first event of the year, a topical event to start the new year, you mentioned it, as the first Vice President responsible for the Members' Research Service in the Library, I have introduced this event every year since the beginning of this term. First, here in 2020, then online during the pandemic, and today we are back, both in person and online, watching from the office or from afar. Opening this event has always been a pleasure. Listening to these short presentations on key issues, learning, understanding what is at stake in the year ahead of us, this is a pleasure. I hope not only for me, I hope for all of you but it is also a duty. 
being informed, having the objective, independent information that at the end and the policy analysts provide us with. This allows us to hold an open-minded debate and then take informed decisions. I see it as a duty as a member of this House and also as First Vice President of the European Parliament, caring for our democracy, having parliamentary democracy and modern parliamentarism in my portfolio, standing up for our model of a liberal democracy. This is important, especially now. As we enter an election year that will lead us in five months, on 6th to 9th June, to elect the future European Parliament. So before we dig into the matter, let me share three reflections with you. First, elections are always a moment to pause and reflect. What kind of world do we want to live in? What are our priorities? What vision do we choose? These are very important questions. They have always been important. They may be more important than ever in today's volatile and violent world. This year, some say, is the biggest election year in history. Indeed, more than half of the world population are voting this year. We may be familiar with the US elections. I am glad to see that this makes one of the 10 issues. Watch also the elections in India. Here again, good that you have chosen to focus on India. And there are many others from the United Kingdom to Russia. Voting does not always equal to democracy. When there is no choice, when there is no opposition, or when the opposition is killed or in prison, when the rule of law does not prevail, elections are not free, elections are not fair. Elections are not democratic. On the opposite, the European Union's core values are freedom, democracy, the rule of law and respect for human rights. These words are in court in our treaties. But they must also be lived, experienced by European citizens. in a world where authoritarian tension is on the rise. The European elections will be about choosing the kind of world we want to live in. The European elections will be about defending our core values. You focus on these values in your contributions on Ukraine. We are looking forward to listening to you. Let me then move to my second reflection, the European Green Deal and our economy. You also deal with it with a focus on the automotive industry. You mentioned it, Etienne. So, is the Green Deal a threat to the economy? Should we soften the target set? Act more slowly? Or reverse decisions and laws? Or can the European Green Deal be a chance, a chance for the economy? Can Europe show that there is another way? 
implementing the sustainable social market economy. I believe the answer is clear. I hope so. There is a need. And there is a way that strengthens the economy and protects the European social model. In today's world, where some experts pressure to go backwards on climate, Europe has a chance to, to position itself as this role model in the world. The Green Deal should be understood also as economic investment and competitiveness program on the basis of our sustainable social market economy. And now let me move to my third and final thought. For this final thought, I will go back to where I started, the European elections, the elections of the next European Parliament, the only one multinational parliament in the world with direct elected members and legislative power. A parliament that, let me highlight this, has undertaken and adopted a series of reforms to strengthen its integrity, independence and accountability. The European Parliament that will work in the next five years will be the result of hundreds of millions of individual decisions. Each of us has an equal power to decide on our common future. It depends on each individual. I really depends on each and every one of us. It is not only the European Parliament that depends on each of us. It is ultimately our model of liberal democracy. And this liberal democracy is under threat. With disinformation spreading, multiplied by the latest technologies. I'm very concerned by this risk. And I congratulate you on choosing it as one of the 10 issues to watch. If we want to continue to live in a liberal democracy, we need to get the right information, get to the polls, and be ready to stand for our model of liberal democracy. So let's get started and listen to today's speakers. I thank you for your attention and give the floor back to Etienne to guide us through 10 issues to watch this year. Thank you. Merci. Vielen Dank. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vice President, for, for your remarks and for, for setting the seat so effectively. Uh, and let's start the, the challenge to cover these 10 issues to watch in the, the time given. So each author has uh, three minutes, not more. This is what we agreed before, so it's a bit of a challenge. The texts are longer and uh, there will be copies available at the end of this meeting for you to take away. So I ask you not to read when the author speaks, but bear in mind that when they present, they just give uh, a glance on uh, their research and they cannot cover everything. So we are going to start with Ukraine. It's quite obvious that Ukraine is still the crisis at um, the border of the Union. And we are going to look at a particular issue, which is the reconstruction of Ukraine, which is already going on. And we are going to do this uh, from the budget perspective with uh, Tim Peters. And Tim is the head of our budgetary policy unit. Over to you, Tim. Hello, thanks Etienne and hello from me to everyone. Um, I will speak about uh, the EU financing for Ukraine's reconstruction. Um, since the beginning of the full-scale invasion in 2022, no other country or block of countries has provided more financial, military and humanitarian support to Ukraine than the Team Europe, consisting of the EU and the member states. The US is uh, second right after us, with a particular focus, of course, on the military. And together, the EU 
and the U.S. support Ukraine have been and will also in 2024 be instrumental for Ukraine's victory against the Russian occupiers. In June 2023, the European Commission presented a proposal for a Ukraine facility to finance the support to Ukraine um, from 2024, so this year until 2027, with up to 50 billion euro. And where do we stand with this file today? The European uh, Parliament already last October has adopted uh, a negotiating position and for the European Parliament, the important points in this file are that the European Parliament is actually deciding on the equal footing with the Council on this facility, which hadn't been the case in the original Commission proposal. But the European Parliament also wants the Ukrainian Parliament and civil society to be fully involved, because particularly for a candidate country, it's of course important to foster um, democratic accountability and debate. And another important point for the European Parliament is also to use frozen Russian assets to finance the reconstruction of Ukraine. Unfortunately, the Council so far hasn't adopted any final position on the Ukraine facility. The main challenge is that to finance the Ukraine facility from the EU budget, you need to revise the multi-annual financial framework. That has to be done unanimously in the Council, and everybody here has followed the last Council, and there was a veto from one country, and that's uh, where we stand so far in the Council. However, now we're looking at the extraordinary European Council on the 1st of February, and um, I would safely assume that this Council will adopt financial support for Ukraine, even in the form of the Ukraine facility. Um, that's what the Commission wants, that's what the European Parliament wants, and that's also what 26 member states want. And all of them also prefer a solution within the EU budget and within the MFF, but the 26 member states have also clearly expressed their commitment that they will not let one country block the necessary support for Ukraine. So if it's not possible within the multi-annual financial framework, the Commission is working on options to finance the support to Ukraine also outside the MFF. That would be probably with 26 national contribution agreements from the member states' budgets paid into the EU budget via um, external assigned revenue. That's perfectly doable. However, no one really wants it because apart from the political sign that it would send that we are not fully united, it's also a quite lengthy and complex process in 26 member states to, uh, and has less democratic scrutiny and transparency on the European level. Another important date for Ukraine in 2024 will be the next Ukraine Recovery Conference, which is scheduled in Berlin on the 11th and 12th of June. And there, everybody expects additional momentum for further private investment into Ukraine. The former EIB president, Werner Hoyer, expected that we need around 1 trillion euro, 1 trillion euro to rebuild Ukraine. The good news is at least that it would be mainly private investment that will be used to finance that uh, sum of money and not the taxpayer. The EU needs Ukraine to defend um, Europe against an imperialist Russia, which also threatens the territorial integrity of the eastern member states of the European Union. And we also need Ukraine as a beacon of freedom and democracy in Europe's east. And therefore, I conclude, Ukraine needs Europe, but Europe also needs Ukraine. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Tim, for, for this presentation. Also, for, for keeping the time, quite a challenging, uh, challenging task. Um, we're going to stay on, on, on Ukraine and look at uh, a very particular uh, aspect of the war and the atrocities around the war. It's a question of victims. And uh, Silvia Kotanidis, who is a member of the Citizens Policy team, has looked at international core crime, how they are prosecuted, but also the reparation of the rights of the victims. And I would like to ask you why you choose to, to focus on this topic and to develop a little bit. Over to you, Silvia. Thank you. Thank you, Etienne. In fact, uh, we chose this topic because <clears throat> beyond uh, the current unspeakable pain and uh, utter destruction of, uh, that is going on in Ukraine, is now high time to think about restoring justice, uh, either legally or materially. 
So um, to summarize, there are basically three main threats of uh, um, litigation at an international level um, that uh, affect Ukraine. So the first one is uh, a litigation that has been established before the International uh, uh, Criminal Court. Uh, that is a litigation that, uh, that is a court that basically has uh, the purpose, uh, the mission to prosecute uh, core crimes, so the highest, uh, the, the most serious crimes committed by individuals. Um, with respect to Ukraine, uh, 43 uh, state parties have uh, asked the prosecutor to start investigation and the uh, prosecutor has started investigation already since 2022. And we know that later on uh, the uh, International Criminal Court has issued an arrest warrant against uh, Putin and uh, uh, Levova Belova is uh, the Minister for uh, Protection of Children for the deportation of children from uh, the uh, occupied territories. So this is one uh, threat. However, the uh, International Criminal Court uh, cannot, in the particular situation of Ukraine, persecute the crime of aggression because there is a special... Uh, technicality that uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, although it has accepted the jurisdiction of ICC, is not uh, a party to it, so has not ratified technically uh, the treaty. So which means that the crime of aggression must be prosecuted uh, in a different way. And now in the international community, academics, uh, political, uh, from the political side, and other type of, uh, you know, thinkers are um, thinking of how to address this issue, which could be either through, for example, an international uh, special tribunal or could be through an hybrid uh, court, so something that has uh, the characteristic of a domestic court but with an international, inter internationalized aspects. So this is the first thread, uh, and uh, the second thread is the thread is basically the case that Ukraine has started before the International Court of Justice to have assessed that Ukraine, which is uh, quite unusual, uh, so Ukraine is asking to assess that it has not committed genocide in the uh, oblast of uh, Luhansk and Donetsk, because this is the pretext that was alleged for an invasion of those territories. So Ukraine itself is asking that. So that is very important to, to, to remember. And uh, okay, this case is going on and we have not uh, yet uh, um, uh, a judgment. We have, however, an interim uh, order that uh, basically orders uh, Russia to, uh, Russian Confederation to stop uh, the special military operation and the violence in those areas. The third threat of uh, uh, court cases is the ones, once I say, because they are either individual cases or interstate cases established before the Court of Human Rights. And there, we know that uh, Russia has been, uh, is not part of, the, uh, of that uh, institution, but uh, uh, the court will examine cases as of uh, um, before, uh, I think, September 2022. Now, coming to reparations, um, it's obvious that if Ukraine is successful in those cases, there will be reparation paid to Ukraine. However, they might come too late because reparation has to start now, and they might not be very high because typically those courts do not award very high uh, amounts of reparation. So, the international community is thinking of how uh, to obviate to this, uh, to this problem. And one of the things that are being considered is uh, one of the avenues is to use uh, the uh, Russian state assets, particularly those of the um, central bank, that are being held in several jurisdictions, uh, Belgium uh, particularly, but also UK, Germany, France, uh, etc., US, etc. But there are, of course, very practical and uh, legally challenging questions because um, international law kicks in. So, to come back to your question, Etienne, I think uh, um, at least for the crime of aggression and of how to use, uh, how to retrieve the funds for uh, uh, financing the operation of, uh, of Ukraine, the reconstruction of Ukraine, I think 2024 will be a crucial year.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sylvia. Let's stay uh, a little bit on Ukraine and let's look at uh, another perspective, uh, the perspective of the US. It was said by Tim that the EU or Team Europe is one of the biggest contributors uh, to, to help Ukraine, but also the US are, more maybe, more maybe from the military angle. So I'd like to turn to, to Gisela, who is a policy analyst in our external policies unit, and um, um, to ask her, what are the positions of the presidential candidates towards this question of Ukraine? Not an easy question, I know, but... Uh, thank you very much, Etienne, for this question, and hello to everybody. The presidential frontrunners, Biden and Trump, that are likely to run against each other again, could not disagree more on this issue. On a scale ranging from comprehensive support to Ukraine to none at all, Biden would be at one extreme end, Trump at the other and Nikki Haley in the middle. Biden, if re-elected, would continue to, sub, sub, to submit funding requests to US Congress for military, budgetary, and humanitarian support. But their approval would depend on the new majorities in the next Congress. Since last October, Biden's supplementary budgetary request for 24, that includes $60 billion for Ukraine, has been blocked in Congress for the time being. Trump, by contrast, sees the war in Ukraine through the lens of an isolationist foreign policy and as yet another never-ending US war which must be terminated immediately. He has claimed that as a president, he would negotiate an end to the war within 24 hours but has not provided details on how a potential peace settlement would look like and who would participate in the talks. We may consider this as only bold election rhetoric, but Trump's intervention could produce an outcome which may be very different from President Zelensky's own peace initiative. And finally, Nikki Haley. Um, she backs only military support to Ukraine. She argues that it would send a strong message of, of resolve to all U.S. adversaries and that defeating Russia would help deter China from invading Taiwan. Gisela, we understand that uh, the cutoff date for the publication was the 10th of January, so things are moving very rapidly on the, on the, on the U.S. scene uh, for the presidential election. Maybe one point you could uh, dig in is... Um, what can we expect from a, a match that would be, again, a Biden-Trump match? So maybe look first at the Trump side. It would be interesting to watch whether Trump's civil, criminal, and constitutional law cases at some point will diminish voter support for him rather than increasing it. One question before Super Tuesday is whether the federal Supreme Court will allow Trump to remain on the primary ballot in Colorado, or whether it will disqualify him under the insurrection clause of the US Constitution. Another question before election day on the 5th of November is how a potential jail sentence in Trump's four criminal law suits would impact on the decision of moderate Republicans, independents, and swing voters. And after election day, how Trump and his loyal base would react to a Biden win. On the Biden side, whether Biden will find ways of reversing polls that suggest that he is neck to neck with Trump and even trails him in vital swing states, and whether Biden can again mobilize voters at the level of 2020 and win back particularly young voters and Arab Americans opposed to Biden's strong backing of Netanyahu in the Gaza Strip crisis. And whether topics such as threats to US democracy, climate change, and abortion rights will outweigh Republican topics such as border security and the perception of voters in general that they are now economically worse off than under Trump. And finally, whether third party candidates like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. may play a bigger role as spoilers than in previous elections because 70% of Americans do not want to see a match Biden-Trump. Thank you, Gisela. You covered already a lot of ground, but uh, another point, final point that you raised in your, in, your ten, in your issue, among the 10 issues, is what this election means for Europe. And uh, maybe you say a few words on that as well. A second Biden term would mean policy continuity and predictability in transatlantic relations based on a strong U.S. commitment to defend every inch of NATO territory, 
as well as on shared democratic values and the conviction that there is a vital need to defend the international rules-based order as we know it. A second Trump term would not necessarily share all these basic tenets. Trump's American first policy would be isolationist, would turn its back on multilateralism and concentrate on its domestic agenda. And as we can see from the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025, a second Trump administration would be better prepared and aligned. It would focus on the Indo-Pacific, encountering China, and would not see much value in the EU that Trump believes has long taken advantage of the US. Republican hawkishness on China could mean that the transatlantic consensus on de-risking would no longer hold. On trade, Trump would again weaponize US import tariffs. And lastly, and most importantly, on defense. Trump has repeatedly questioned the long-standing U.S. commitments to Europe's security. In his second term, Trump would likely no longer limit himself to push the Europeans on the 2% 2, 2 military spending target. He would certainly wind down the U.S. military posture in Europe. And even if he were to respect the legal guardrails Congress recently enacted to make it harder for a future U.S. president to pull out of NATO, he may nonetheless as a commander-in-chief undermined the credibility of NATO's, NATO's Article 5 by simply repeating statements that the U.S. would not come to Europe's defense. So Europeans should better get prepared for such a scenario. Thank you, Gisela. Let us, let us stay for a while in, uh, in the field of international relations and relation to other countries and blocs, and uh, let's stay also with that particular unit. And I'm going to ask Angelos, who is uh, a police analyst there, to look at India. Uh, he's going to do that from, from there because that's his choice. And uh, the question is, uh, India, is it uh, it's a middle power? Is it going to be a great power? Um. Thank you, Etienne. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, indeed, uh, following 20, 30 years after the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, we moved from a unipolar world to a multipolar world with, of course, another superpower in the making, China, and several middle uh, powers rising. We could give examples such as India, of course, uh, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, uh, Brazil. Now, the, the concept of great power, world power, is elusive. There is no final saying on it. But there are a few elements in research that have been, uh, um, that can help us to encompass, let's say, the, the, the point, and those are economic power, uh, military might, of course, uh, diplomatic influence, and uh, uh, also soft power, what we call soft power. Now, India, in that, concept, uh, in that context, has several of those elements. First of all, it has a huge uh, land area, and as of 2023, it is the most populous uh, population in the world. Um, its economy is uh, increasing at high rates, of course. Its GDP has, uh, growth rate has exceeded China's uh, in the last uh, two, three years, and it's projected to continue doing so. Um, it has uh, strengthening uh, its trade presence with uh, several free trade agreements that are negotiated both with, uh, for example, the EU currently or the UK. It has a significant military presence, uh, both in terms of manpower and in terms of expenditure. And, of course, everyone knows that it is part of the closed club of the uh, nuclear powers. And um, it has a multi-pronged strategy with regards to infrastructure. So it has increased its expenditures within the country. It participates in international projects, such as the North-South International Transport Corridor, the India-Middle East Economic Corridor. Um, it has digital infrastructure, which it's championed uh, during the G20, of which it held the presidency this year. And it has a complete space program uh, that we heard of in 2023. Um, it maintains a strong diplomatic presence through its participation in several fora, such as the G20 on one side and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in the other, for example. So it strikes a balance between what we call the West and the rest. Um, and uh, through, uh, I mean, everyone knows Bollywood, uh, International Yoga Day, so it engages in soft power through those elements. At the same time, there are a few points that are challenges, that are holding, her, holding India back. It has a strong military presence, but a big portion of its expenditures and its manpower are mainly used for internal reasons, for security. 
for um, uh, potential conflicts with its immediate neighbors, Pakistan or China. Um, uh, and of course, a certain portion of the expenditures are used to maintain the impressive manpower that it has. It is a country that has no oil or gas self-sufficiency, which means that it is dependent on third country providers, such as Russia on one side or uh, the Middle East on the other. Moreover, its infrastructure is not yet as developed to sustain its growing energy needs, so it needs to do more in that respect. Uh, it is a country that has been impacted by climate change and by the environmental changes. Uh, we constantly hear about floods, about increasing temperatures, uh, about the fact that it has some of the most polluted cities with regards to air quality in the, in the world. And finally, um, all of the above, like economic, social, environmental, and other concerns, are denting its soft power projection outside the country. Now, in that context, 2024 is a very important year, but not only because there are elections in India, also because there are elections, as we all know, uh, and as our, my colleague has mentioned, in the US and in the EU, which are important key allies of India, because some trade agreements, for example, the UK, possibly the, with the EU, but we don't know, might be finalized in 2024, 2025, and also because some of its existing policies might evolve or change depending on how the international situation changes. And I'm thinking about the, the war between Russia and Ukraine or uh, other such elements. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angelus. Uh, you mentioned the climate challenge that uh, India is facing, and I would like to dig in a little bit in this question of climate now. Uh, Enrique wrote a paper on climate overshoot and adaptation, and he's covering several issues. Enrique is part of our climate action research and tracking service. And one of the issues that you, you cover is um, what are the means in terms of the climate goals that you has agreed to and how we can act on it. Okay. Thank you, Etienne. Good afternoon to everyone here and online. Uh, there are some bad news, some more bad news, but also some hope. Uh, I would like to start off with an example. Uh, picture this. Uh, we're using an oven and it cooks, then it's time to turn it off. Uh, but even after quite some time, the inside, it's still too hot to handle. And in order to reach in and grab our dinner, we need to make use of an oven mitt. So we adapt. Taking the analogy to the state of climate change in our planet, the temperature in our oven, it's dependent on the greenhouse gas concentrations in our atmosphere, which have been ever rising since the Industrial Revolution. In 2015, our global leaders committed to limit global temperature increase to well below 2 degrees above pre-industrial levels with efforts to stay within 1.5 limit. Nevertheless, 2023 was the warmest year on record, and on 17 November 2023, also, for the first time on record, our planet crossed the two-degree threshold, even if just for a day. And now it, our greenhouse emissions are declining, so does it mean that we are reaching the targets? Well, um, it is true, but despite such efforts, global emissions have been reaching new global heights to a point where the IPCC admits that it's almost inevitable that we will temporarily exceed the 1.5 degree, degrees but could return below it uh, by the end of the century. Uh, this climate overshoot would amplify both climate variability and its extremes and further extend uh, related economic losses, which from 1980 to 2021 already amounted to over half a trillion euros in the EU alone. So therefore, all options should be on the table to tackle the changing climate. Even if mitigation action actions and legislation have been are essential to stop a uh, continued global temperature rise, we must combine those with clear and supported adaptation actions as climate change is already set in motion require us to do so. Uh, currently, between what we need and what we have in terms of funding to fully address all known necessary climate adaptation actions, there is today a huge worldwide gap. As I mentioned, in Europe, the last four decades, uh, the economic losses driven from climate and weather events uh, were enormous, but the death figures are even more shocking. And can you tell a bit more about these figures? Well, in the publication, we address these numbers. I encourage everyone to ever, re ever read at our publication and realize how dire the situation is. 
But as a quick spoiler, I will tell you that for the duration of this event, one person in Europe has died in circumstances that can be attributed to climate or weather. But despite such numbers, in Europe we're still lacking binding adaptation targets. Uh, recently, at COP28, the parties agreed on a framework to achieve the global goal on adaptation and renewed the pledge to double global international adaptation finance um, from 2019 levels by 2025. So these are the necessary first steps to close the, finance, the adaptation finance gap and to level the playing field between adaptation and mitigation. Thank you, Nick. I understand we have a question from the floor already. Uh, not, not yet. So um, just um, if you can finalize it, what, what you raise in your paper is what are the benefits of such action, if you can conclude yeah, that. Yeah, well, well uh, already today and increasingly so uh, in light of the lagging uh, global climate action, um, we must reduce our vulnerabilities. And why? Well, put simply, to save our uh, means to construct a living and ultimately our lives. Thank you, Enrique. So we are now going to look at another aspect of uh, climate change with, uh, with Antonio. Uh, Antonio is part of our structural policies unit covering uh, also agriculture and food, and he's going to look at the so-called El Nino phenomenon, which is a sort of extreme uh, event of climate change. And those who watch French television, they have maybe seen that there were uh, abnormal uh, storm going on in the Réunion and Indian Ocean in the last weeks. And I think this is an effect, a very concrete effect of El Nino dis uh, destructing crops and so on and so forth. So um, if you could explain what it is, El Nino, and um, why we should worry about it. Thank you, Tim. And good afternoon, everybody. So uh, first of all, and contrary to what many people uh, think, El Nino is not uh, one storm, it is not one hurricane. It is actually one phase of a larger climate phenomenon that happens every two to seven uh, years and is located mostly on the Pacific Ocean, but it has global uh, repercussions. And, and indeed, uh, we should be worried in 2024 about El Nino, uh, basically for three reasons. Um, the first one is that uh, El Nino normally affects regions that are, that are either uh, food insecure or important food producers and food exporters. The second reason is that El Nino normally leads to higher global temperatures. So here we see um, rainfall uh, temperatures and global production of food and exports of food. So these are three elements that influence highly food security. But in particular, we should be worried because we are not facing a normal El Nino. <clears throat> we are already facing a strong event. To give you an idea of the potential cost of a strong El Nino event, beyond agriculture and beyond food security. A recent study estimated that the 1997-1998 El Nino event cost uh, the world uh, 5.7 trillion uh, US dollars. That is, to give you an idea of the cost, that is the current GDP combined of the UK and France. So, uh, definitely uh, reasons to, to worry about El Nino. And, uh, well, regarding the regions and the areas in the world, in the, um, in the publication you have uh, a very complete map that will... Uh, that expands more on this, but I think it's, it's particularly important that we all pay attention to India. Why? India uh, is responsible for 40% of the world's supply of rice. Rice is the staple food for 3.5 billion people in the world. And already, because of uh, the effects last year of El Niño, India had to adopt um, uh, trade restrictions on, on rice. So we should be paying a lot of attention to how the situation evolved this year because of the potential implications of, um, of um, food production in India. Uh, but the European Union is also uh, expected to be affected by, by El Niño. And it's going to be affected in two ways, one external and one internal. On the external one, uh, we estimate that uh, at least 110 million people in the world will need direct food assistance, plus uh, the many millions more that will be food insecure. As the leading uh, humanitarian uh, and development cooperation power in the world, the European Union is likely to um, have to uh, shoulder part of that uh, burden. Uh, but also internally, uh, in recent years, we've faced also in the European Union a very serious uh, food security crisis of affordability. Uh, food inflation reached last year 20% in March, but still remains uh, high. We're at around 6%. 
And although the Russian invasion of Ukraine played a very important role, the biggest threat to our food security is actually extreme weather events. Very high temperatures lead to lower agricultural production that consequently leads to higher prices. So um, 2023, as my colleague Enrique said, was already the hottest year in record. Due to El Niño, we're likely going to face a similar situation or even worse this year. So we could experience, again, uh, very, uh, very high temperatures in Europe, potentially crop destruction and potentially uh, higher food inflation. So, uh, and that will um, affect not only consumers facing higher prices for food likely, but also the European Union will have to again mobilize as has done in previous years, uh, funds to compensate uh, for these losses. So uh, indeed, uh, El Niño is definitely an issue to watch in 2024 and to worry about. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. So we have seen now uh, with the various contributions that there are quite a few challenges that the EU face from the outside. And I like that we go now a bit to the inside and uh, to look at a particular instrument that was established after the COVID crisis, NGEU, Next Generation EU, and um, that should contribute to the so-called twin tran transition, the green and the digital transition. And I'd like to um, ask you, uh, Alessandro, to look at this issue. Alessandro is... Uh, the head of uh, our NGEU tracking service. So please uh, tell us uh, what is the next coming in that field. Thank you, Etienne, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, indeed, uh, the EU recovery instrument uh, is uh, still uh, just uh, as relevant, uh, thanks to a forward-looking uh, design. The twin transition towards uh, a greener and digital society remains uh, a key objective of the decade. And the rest of the world is advancing on this. Uh, for example, China is projected to deploy more than half of new global uh, renewables capacity this year. So inaction uh, is not an option. Uh, to be resilient and inclusive, uh, all sectors uh, need to adapt. Uh, transport, uh, construction, uh, education, public services, uh, you name it. Uh, one common feature is that the level of uh, additional annual investment uh, required in the EU is massive. And what do I mean by massive? Well, it's uh, more than the annual gross domestic product of Belgium. Uh, NGU and its recovery and resilience facility are uh, the main EU tools to finance uh, investment and reform measures with green and digital objectives. So, uh, but 2024, what is particularly interesting to watch this year? What's going to happen this year? Uh, I think uh, there are uh, at least uh, three reasons that we should uh, consider. First, uh, uh, implementation. Uh, while the recovery plans uh, are uh, broadly on track, uh, the revision uh, to include uh, new energy measures uh, and address uh, uh, unexpected challenges uh, such as high inflation may have slowed down implementation in the second half of 2023. And uh, eight uh, out of 10 of the green and digital objectives uh, have uh, yet to be achieved. Let's remember that the deadline is August uh, 2026. So member states uh, should really give new momentum uh, to implementation. The recovery facility has been designed to ensure tangible results for citizens and businesses across the EU. Uh, let me give you just a couple of examples for this year. Uh, for uh, citizens, uh, uh, a high-speed internet connection for one in five educational establishments uh, in Slovenia. For businesses, uh, the introduction of uh, streamlined rules uh, for wind energy projects uh, in Estonia. In times of uh, tighter monetary policy and renewed application of uh, EU fiscal rules, uh, the EU cannot afford to lose uh, strategic resources uh, because of slow implementation. The second reason for uh, watching uh, NGU this year is uh, scrutiny. Uh, of course, uh, it is essential not just to use the resources, but also to use them well and address possible weaknesses. Uh, um, next month, uh, the European Commission is due to submit uh, the midterm evaluation uh, of the recovery facility. 
and the European Parliament plays a key role in scrutiny, including through the discharge procedure with a vote expected in April. The third reason is forward planning. Recovery support is by definition temporary, but strategic investment needs are long term. So scrutiny activities are also expected uh, to inform uh, the debate uh, on how to finance uh, green and digital objectives after 2026. So if you are interested in more analysis uh, in uh, these three topics, uh, uh, implementation, uh, scrutiny, forward planning, I invite you to consult uh, our briefings on the national plans uh, and their uh, uh, sectoral dimensions. In the 10 issues to watch, you will find uh, a link uh, to a page uh, with all our publications on these topics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. It's always good also to do a bit of self-advertising. Well done. Uh, let's, uh, you mentioned a twin transition, green and digital transition, and there is a particular sector that is at the crossroad of these two. It's the automotive industry. I mean, the automotive industry in, in Europe is known for its excellence. We have uh, in engineering, we have uh, technology, and so on, and we have been a world leader for quite a long time. But are we ready to uh, go for this transition? Over to you, Guillaume. Guillaume is a member of our Economic Policies Unit Policy Analyst there. Thank you, Etienne. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm the 10th speaker, so I hope you are still with me. <laughs> so why should you be with me? Because with this topic, the future of the EU car industry, we have an impressive example of uh, the concrete impact of the green and digital transition on a major European industrial sector, a historical sector, by the way. And in 2024, uh, during the electoral campaign for the European elections, you will all probably hear about one of the most emblematic decisions uh, taken by the EU under the Green Deal, which is the de facto end of the sale of internal combustion engine cars uh, planned for 2035. Um, so this is a game changer for the industry, but it's only one of the many, many other developments that are fully reshaping the sector. And we expect that in the next decade, uh, the industry will change more than it has in the past century. So what are the trends that are currently uh, affecting the sector? First, electrification. As you know, electrification has been the leading strategy uh, implemented by the industry to produce zero uh, tailpipe emission cars. This is well known. The second trend is connectivity. Cars are becoming more and more uh, connected, connected to the internet, connected to uh, other cars, connected to road infrastructure. Third trend is uh, um, the development of autonomous features uh, in cars. So they will be able to perform uh, some or all, maybe in the future, of the driving features. And fourth, uh, shared mobility, which is a shift from car ownership to car usership, is, is expected to become uh, more common. So today, if you think about a car, uh, you should think about a big computer with four wheels uh, and a big battery. That's how a car is now and will be even more in the future. And that's also why um, cars are more and more dependent on their chips and software content. Uh, the value of a modern car is for one third in its chips. Uh, and the success of a car uh, in the future and already a bit now will depend more and more on its software content rather than on its mechanical uh, performance. For example, on the software governing the safety features of the car, uh, the infotainment system, or also the, just the operating system of the car, like you have an operating system in your smartphone. Last but not least, uh, um, uh, an electric car is much easier to assemble compared to a traditional car because, for example, uh, an electric motor only has 20 moving parts while an internal combustion engine has more than 2,000, so 100 more moving parts in a typical car. So that's why um, companies coming from the tech sector or the battery sector were able to enter the market because uh, barrier to, barriers to entry in the market have been lowered. Um, so now take China. 
China uh, bet on the development of electric cars already a long time ago. And in 2023, China became the first global exporter of, car for the, of cars for the first time, thanks to their export of electric vehicles. And uh, a significant development was that uh, in the last quarter of 2023, a Chinese company coming from the battery sector became the, the world leader uh, in terms of production of electric cars, ahead of Tesla. Uh, and importantly, uh, China uh, is a leader in the production of nearly all the components needed to build an electric car, uh, from batteries to raw materials uh, and also uh, in the chip sector. So, in these conditions, how could the EU uh, industry thrive? Um, for example, we could say that uh, it would need to have a, a secure access to affordable raw materials, batteries and chips, uh, for the future. It should, it should also reduce its cost because producing an electric car is uh, more expensive at the moment than a conventional car. The materials bill is particularly uh, expensive in an uh, electric car. Uh, the EU industry should also improve its innovation capacities in digital technologies, which has been a weak point of our industry. And also we could say that uh, the EU industry should improve its circularity, meaning that uh, it should try to keep in the loop uh, the critical raw materials it uses uh, for as long as possible. So uh, naturally the supporting infrastructure such as the uh, grid, uh, charging stations, uh, green electricity should also be developed and this requires a huge investments, public, private, uh, as uh, Alessandro already mentioned before. So to conclude, Etienne, back to my starting point, in this electoral year, we should not forget that uh, the changes affecting this industry uh, are affecting millions of European citizens uh, in the industry, uh, along the whole supply chain, from uh, car suppliers to uh, the after-sale market, and also as drivers, especially for uh, citizens living in remote areas and rural areas, who need an electric car, uh, which is still at the moment, uh, which are at the moment very expensive. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Guillaume. Uh, indeed, a very interesting uh, aspect uh, to, to watch for, for the development of uh, European industry. We come now to the two last presentations, which are very much linked to the electoral year for the European Union. Um, the first of them is uh, by Ma Negrero, and Ma unfortunately felt sick, so she's not with us today, and she asked me to say a few words about uh, her text, which I invite you to read in full in uh, the paper version. Uh, and you will uh, allow me to look at my notes when I do this presentation, not like the other colleagues. Uh, she insists in her pre presentation like uh, on the context to 2024, as many said, is a crucial year for democracy, as there are elections in the EU, but also in the US and in many places in the world. And she insists that uh, generative AI plays an increasing role there. Voters on both sides of the Atlantic worried about fake reality, hundreds of thousands deep fakes circulating online last year, getting increasingly sophisticated, accessible and affordable. So election this year are a battleground to continue improving them. They are based on machine learning technologies from January election to December when they will get even more sophisticated. So then she looks in her paper how we can fight these uh, fake news and disinformation online. And she mentioned three elements. First of all, she says that uh, we can use technology to fight malicious technology, so technology against technology. That's contact recognition labeling with watermarks or cryptographic signatures. But it's only reliable, uh, it's, it's only to a certain extent reliable as not all players uh, are following this. The other way is humans to fight malicious use of technology. And I'm sure there are some colleagues from our DG communications there. And a way to do this is to create a community of fact checkers. And these fact checkers work with institutions. And then uh, they push um, corrective in the uh, infosphere. So uh, media literacy is also important to play, uh, plays also an important role there, uh, at least to make voters more aware of them. And then the third element she mentioned, after the use of technology against uh, malicious technology, humans to fight malicious technology, it's of course regulation or legislation. China has its way, uh, the more authoritarian way, so the technology uh, is, uh, the legislation is used there to protect the regime. Uh, and to uh, 
disclose propaganda. In the US, it's more sorts of self-regulation. Um, and uh, President Biden executive order aimed to protect US government communication with Americans and to support the ecosystem and bring experts from abroad to workforce or brain drain. Brain, uh, drain. Uh, but then between China and the US, there is also the European way, and that was extremely well described uh, a couple of weeks ago. We had Anu Bradford in this room, and she explained uh, the three digital empires, China, US, and Europe, and the way of Europe is to regulate and to have a human-centric regulation. And it's extraordinary that the EU has acted during this particular term. AI Act was agreed, will not be enforced for the election, will be enforced in 2025. Uh, and for the next EP election, we have uh, the Digital Service Act that is uh, in place. So this was the presentation of uh, Ma. She would have done much better. Uh, she's probably watching us uh, now. So I encourage you to read uh, the original. And we move with that to the final uh, presentation, which will be uh, by Michaela Del Monte. Michaela is uh, the head of our Citizens Policy Unit. And she is going to look at the European election uh, in June from a particular angle. It's from the situation of young people and, in particular, young voter participation. So over to you, Michaela. Thank you, Etienne, and, and welcome, everybody. Uh, yes, uh, we, the reason uh, we decide to look at this particular angle are, are, are a couple. Um, so we all know, I hope so, that we are going to vote in June. This will be the 10th European election, and there are uh, more than 360 million people going to vote, hopefully. But uh, we might also remember that uh, during the last election in 19, we reached an unprecedented peak of turnout, uh, more than 50%. And when the uh, European Parliament made a survey after that, um, it was known that this was largely due to youth participation. So uh, what could be do or what could be done uh, to repeat this, uh, uh, this uh, unprecedented success? Um, we, we looked at the research and we looked also at what is available for the moment. It's, uh, we might say that it is a relatively recent research on young voters, but uh, at least from a legal point of view, there are four member states which will allow 16 years old to vote, Germany, Austria, Malta, and Belgium, and Greece as of 17 years old. Um, these represent more or less a pool of 2 million voters, so uh, which might affect, Im Im have an immediate effect on the turnout, but also on more longer term, because those young people might learn a, a habit of voting. And, and even more, uh, there is research which shows that parents of young voters might be more willing to vote, go to vote because they want to show the good example to, to their kids. Um, there are uh, other couple of reasons. One is that there is a strong political will, uh, both from side of parliament and commission to engage with citizens. This was clearly shown by the president of the parliament and the commission during the youth event, uh, during the youth year. And uh, the parliament uh, very often repeated more recently in uh, September resolution on parliamentaries and European citizens, uh, citizenships and democracy, that young people are encouraged to take a stand and to take an active participation into the political life. This was also one of the main results of the Conference on the Future of Europe. Uh, there were several recommendations from the citizens, but also several of the measure, uh, final measure inviting citizens, young citizens, to take a stand, but also envisaging some measure like um, lowering the voting age, lowering the, uh, the age to stand as candidates, in some cases even envisaging uh, introducing binding uh, youth quota for parliaments. So one other reason why we, th we, we thought it was important is also that um, in a way contrary to um, conventional wisdom, uh, youth are far from being apolitical or disengaged. But in fact, they use other forms to express their willingness to participate. Of course, they take advantage of the new measure or the new uh, social media, internet, so they engage in tweeting campaigns, email campaigns. 
but they also, in a way, take the streets. So they attend a demonstration, they sign a petition, they go on strike. But still, also according to the, uh, this is important, I think, according to survey, they consider that the primary form of expressing their willingness to uh, participate in politics is voting. So votes remain their primary form. Um, the last, the last uh, thing I will mention maybe is that they also have clear expectation. Um, this is in terms of political response. They are waiting for the, our political master in terms of climate change, unemployment, disequality. They um, have a clear understanding in what is democracy and they are particularly satisfied with the work of the European Union when it comes to Ukraine and to respect of the fundamental value and fundamental rights, but still, and there is a still, they consider that their view and their concern, they are not totally fully embraced by the political masters. So, of course, the, the papers develop a little bit and there are other reasons, but in, in, in three minutes, this is the main reason why we consider that this should be something to look at this year. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Michaela. And with this, we, we come to the part of the presentations of the 10 issues to watch. We hope you enjoyed it. We have now a little bit of time for discussions. I had in my mind a couple of questions, but since the time is already quite advanced, and actually probably some of you did more than three minutes each, but that's fine. Uh, I prefer to go straight to the room and ask if there are questions uh, in the room. And I would like to ask our colleagues uh, having the microphones to, to help. I see the gentleman in the front, in the third row, and just to say who you are, uh, that would be helpful for, for us and say who you are putting your question. Yes, uh, thank you very much. My name is Karl Schenk from Volkswagen Group. Uh, it was very interesting for me to hear on the uh, automotive uh, section to be in the top uh, 10 issues to watch. Uh, my question is, however, I don't know quite know who, they, who to direct it to um, regarding international trade. Um, because it's touching a bit on food security if we talk about international cooperation, coordination, but confrontation, if that is um, a topic or what you would expect um, in 2024 uh, on, that, on that issue. Well, it's a, it's a very general question. I think these are issues that we didn't raise in that particular uh, 10 issues to watch, but of course there are issues uh, that you can follow in other publications uh, from us. Um, I'm not a trade expert, but what I understand is that there is a tendency on protectionism. Uh, this is something that we can watch. I think uh, uh, all of us can watch. Uh, let's see, this is something that we discussed also in previous years, but we have uh, to see how things evolve, but this is my, my impression there. Um, I don't know if some of the colleagues want to add something on the particular uh, aspect of the uh, car industry. Uh, well, I'm not a, <clears throat> a specialist in international trade, but I mean, uh, regarding this aspect and the car industry, we know that there is currently this investigation going on uh, at European level on uh, imports of uh, electric cars from China. And uh, we can expect in the course of the year the results of this investigation. Uh, so this is quite a tricky issue. Um, the US, for example, applies uh, high uh, duties on uh, Chinese cars imported to, into the US, like 21%. Uh, which is not the case in Europe. So this will be for sure one of the important developments to, to follow this year. Knowing that many European companies have interest in China, uh, producing part of their vehicles there, especially electric vehicles too. Not only the Chinese brands, but also European brands uh, have factories in China. Uh, any other question? Yes, uh, right there with the glasses in the front. Thank you. Uh, Anna Ruiz from DGA. I have, a, I have a question regarding, it's a general question. We've been hearing that the next commission and the next parliament will focus much more on implementation. And in some of the cases when we're talking about twin transition in the automotive sector, do you also expect that to be the case? More implementation of the current regulations and directives rather than putting forward more and more regulations for companies that have to address? Well, this is something, uh, maybe some colleagues can comment, but this is something that, uh, that the next commission will have to decide. It's clear that in this uh, term, uh, the 
twin transition, the so-called twin transition, digital and green transition, were the two top priorities of this commission. It came already with the Juncker Commission a little bit before. Uh, there has been a lot of legislation adopted, and it's true that implementation is an issue, and it might be the focus of the next commission, but it's up to, it's up to the political level to decide, of course. I, I can just add a few words. I cannot see you because you are behind. Uh, but uh, it's true that when we think about the automotive sector, uh, it, it, it has been concerned by a lot of new, uh, new European text, and it has complained that uh, it, it's, it has been under fire uh, from different angles, uh, euro norms, uh, circularity requirements, uh, uh, the decision on uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, pollutants, etc. So, but this is this will be really at the I think at the heart of the next uh, political debates in the electoral campaign, as I said uh, at the beginning of my presentation. I think we had one somewhere here in the middle. Uh, yes, please. And then behind Beatrice, and then my behind. Name is, yes. Sorry, yeah, yeah, please. my name is Beatrix Immenkamp. I work for the External Policies Unit in the EPRS, and I'd like to come back to the question of international core crimes with a question to Sylvia, whether you could give us examples of international core crimes being committed in other parts of the world. Uh, yeah, I've, it's a very general question. I, what I can say is, uh, I mean, it's in the newspapers probably, and uh, everyone uh, expects uh, some kind of a reference to that. But um, yeah, there is a case that has been recently uh, started or uh, filed by uh, South Africa uh, for uh, against uh, Israel on. Uh, um, allegations of violation of the Convention on Genocide. It's uh, it's a very fresh case in the sense that it was filed in uh, December, 29 December, I think, or end of December, uh, 2023. There have been some hearings. Um, the point is that, uh, as far as I can see, it's too early to say what. Uh, there has been a request for an interim measure. Uh, which still has to be decided, um, but um, it's, uh, the, the, the allegations of genocide are very uh, specific in the sense that um, you, you have to, I mean, a state has to show, has to prove that there is genocidal intention, and that, reading the several commentators on, the, on, the, on this case, it's uh, quite a high bar to, to prove. Um, this will not uh, be a reason for not deciding on the interim measure because the interim measure is subject to a different uh, types of rules. For example, also in the case of Ukraine, uh, th there are several specific conditions for the International Court of Justice to uh, award an interim measure. There are, for example, uh, the fact that uh, at first sight it uh, looks like the case, uh, the court is uh, competent or has jurisdiction over that type of crime, so the prima facie uh, jurisdiction uh, for an interim measure to be issued, you need to have a sort of plausibility of uh, the right that is uh, alleged to have been uh, violated, a sort of nexus with what you ask uh, in terms of interim measure and the right that is allegedly violated, the, what we call uh, the fumus boni juris and the periculum immora, which is the fact that the longer it takes for the judgment, the more damages will be. So the urgency sort of... So, According to what I read in the, in the, in the press and in specialized uh, reviews, um, it should be that the interim measure is likely to be probably awarded, which is to stop uh, the operations in, uh, in, in, um, in Gaza. Now, for the decision in the merits, of course, uh, it will take um, quite some years before it's, uh, it's given. Yeah. Thank you, Sylvia. There was a question in the middle by the lady with the glasses. Thank you. Um, thank you. My name is Alice. I work for the paper packaging industry, but my question is totally unrelated. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the speakers for their informed and detailed presentations, which were very useful. And I would also like to ask if you could share with us the reports and that has been mentioned, um, especially the one by Enrique, which was very interesting. So thank you. Um, so my question is about um, a topic that uh, has not 
been mentioned a lot, except uh, uh, for your last uh, intervention. Um, we have mentioned several issues that seem to be far away from a non-expert eye, such as the elections in the USA or the El Nino phenomenon. So I would like to ask you, the speakers in general, or if maybe you have foreseen um, a, pr a publication in the near future about what will be the impact in Europe um, about the uh, humanitarian crisis in Gaza and the military force used by Israel. And by impact, I don't mean only economic, which would be very interesting, but also on democratic perspective, because as Ma Michaela said, youth is active and we see we saw that uh, in several member states um, citizens are not happy with the positioning of the eu concerning this crisis so i was wondering if you would like to say something about what will be the impact on on a democratic point of view if the situation st stays as it is thank you Thank you. Thank you very much. Since it's a general question, I take it. Uh, first of all, on the contribution, thank you for, for, for your words on the, on, the, on the publication. We didn't distribute it in the room because then people start you know, to read when, when presenters are talking, so it's not good. But it will be available when you leave the room, so you will have it, and it's already available online. Uh, concerning Gaza, we have uh, published quite a series of publications already, so they are all already available online and we are still working on it at the request of members of parliament because it's our core constituency, of course, also proactively uh, for the parliamentary community and the issues you have mentioned are, are part of them and thank you for, for, the, for the suggestions. Uh, yes, uh, now everyone, uh, I see also that there are questions online, so I will go online. No, not yet. So uh, here, the gentleman uh, here, right? Hi, I'm Benjamin Gioni. I work for uh, EIM Rail, and I wanted to ask um, if climate change adaptation is so important to maintain the quality of life, uh, why was critical infrastructure not part of the societal resilience plan? And uh, why can we not use EU funds to uh, adapt critical infrastructure to climate change? Thank you. I didn't understand the organization, sorry. EIM Rail. Right. Sorry. Uh, wants to comment on this? Uh, Enrique, you want to comment? Or Alessandro? Uh, I, I could start, but I think I'll just pass the ball to Alessandro because it falls a little bit outside of my realm of expertise uh, of the climate change and adaptation issues. So, uh, Alessandro. Sure. Uh, actually, uh, EU funding also supports uh, climate adaptation. And uh, for the recovery and resilience facility, there was uh, a, an expenditure target that all member states uh, must uh, meet uh, at least 37% of the resources go to climate relevant expenditure and uh, uh, climate adaptation measures are part of these. Then uh, uh, the recovery and resilience facility is designed in such a way that member states can tailor made uh, their plans uh, um, on the basis of these uh, requirements. So uh, each member state uh, has seen uh, where most needs uh, lie for uh, uh, their uh, economy, their society. Uh, to give you an example, uh, for instance, uh, Bulgaria is the most uh, um, energy intensive uh, uh, EU member state and the Bulgarian plan as a particular focus on energy measures to uh, but there are also uh, uh, climate adaptation measures in uh, several uh, national plans thank you okay i suppose it covers the the question uh, are there any questions here in the i see one here Microphone, please. And uh, the gentleman in the back, yes, I, I saw you, sir. Thank you very much. I have a question on India. I suppose it is to Angelos. You mentioned a free trade agreement between India and the EU. Where are we on this? Thank you. Okay. Uh, Angelos. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we, we, we wrote recently a briefing with colleagues on the, 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 the EU <coughs> in the IFTA. So it is, in fact, uh, the, the, the negotiations started uh, back in 2008, 2000, 2007, 2008, 
but at the time, the, the, the parties were not willing to make the necessary concessions, so they were put in limbo, more or less, by 2013. Uh, given the, uh, I would say recent, it's not so much recent, but given the evolution of the international situation and the geostrategic alignment uh, between the UN and India in some, in some points, the leaders, the respective leaders decided to, uh, to relaunch the negotiations in 2021, and they were officially resumed in 2022. Um, uh, the, the goals were ambitious initially. Uh, the parties were saying that maybe we will manage even to finalize the FTA before the elections in 2024, um, both in India and the EU. Uh, it doesn't look like it is the case. Now the negotiations are uh, ongoing and they're moving forward, which is uh, good. Uh, at the same time, there are, of course, uh, points of conflict, uh, which means that probably they're not going to be done by uh, 2024. But they are moving, uh, we have to understand that it's a huge market, both in one case and in the other, and we cannot just speed up things to, to get to an agreement. Uh, at the same time, we must, we must note that uh, with the EU in the IFTA, there was a Trade and Technology Council, which was established in 2022, which is the second one for us after the one we have with the United States. And there, things are moving also. So we had, at the end of last year, we had... Um, memorandum of understanding on semiconductors between EU and India that was signed. So there is an evolution and there is an increase in the relation between EU and India. Maybe not as fast as some would like, but uh, we will continue following it. Thanks. Thank you, Angelos. And then, sir, in the middle, yes. Um, my name is Moni. I'm a former official of the European Commission, and now I'm working as a consultant for Aki. Uh, my question is on Ukraine. Uh, I have not, uh, I mean, I would appreciate it to have your, uh, if you can elaborate a bit about the, the sanction, sanctions regime and the, the circumvention issues. Uh, my question is uh, referring to the, uh, how the European Parliament plans to work on this issue and which kind of interaction you will have with the Council. Uh, in view of the 13 package and maybe additional packages later on, and how you plan in particular to uh, work together the AFET with INTA, uh, because uh, you have uh, trade issues, you have uh, foreign policy issues, uh, and in my opinion, uh, uh, from uh, an observer viewpoint, I have the impression that the European Parliament uh, has not been so much active in, in the trilogue discussions with the Council and the European External Action Service and the European Commission on the implementation of sanctions. So I would like to know how you intend to work on this issue and which kind of reorganization you plan to, to introduce in, your, in the working practices of your committees on these, on these issues. Uh, sanctions and circumvention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you don't have the whole uh, range of specialists of the EPRS on stage, but Angelos is not only covering India, he can also say a few words on that particular question. Um, yes, we, we actually wrote uh, two briefings that we uh, update on the, on the sanctions, and uh, within the second briefing there is also the question of sanctions circumvention. Now, the, the role of the Parliament, of course, is going to be limited, because at the end of the day it's the Council, it's the 27 member states that will take the decision. So it's not an issue that will go to trilogue. The Parliament, however, has been calling already before the conflict for the adoption of sanctions uh, with regards to certain individuals uh, in Russia before. So it is something that we, have, we are following. Uh, and when I say we, I mean both Parliament is following the situation and we as EPRS are following the issue of sanctions and possible sanctions circumvention. Um, we, uh, with my colleague, I think she's in the audience, we were thinking of updating our current briefing by the middle of this year to address the issues on whether the sanctions are uh, working because there has been growing criticism that some of them are not working or they're not working as they should. But uh, like in many things, there are several opinions on the matter and we would like to present a, a comprehensive option. So please follow what we, <laughs> what we will intend to publish. Thank you. All right, let's change the, the corner here. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for the event. Uh, Filippo Segato from the European Association of Real Estate Profession. Uh, my question is about the reconstruction and the funds to Ukraine. Uh, 
among our members, uh, we have also uh, the, bigger, uh, the biggest Ukrainian uh, real estate uh, manager uh, association. And uh, they are concerned of what Ukraine have to show to European and uh, in general to their ally to unlock these funds. And they're thinking this is maybe connected to the fact that nobody here addressed today, but Ukraine should have election in this year. Of course, we are talking of a country that is uh, in the middle of a crisis, but they're thinking maybe we should hold this election to uh, show that we are want to be represented as a real democracy and we want to go to the, to the West. Thank you. Silvia? Yes, I think, uh, uh, if I may say, I think the, the answer is a bit more complex than that. It's not about showing, because it is, it is clear that there have been violations of international law. The point is how you can act on uh, the assets of a foreign state. It's, uh, I would say, I'm sorry to say it, but it's a very, very hard uh, core legal uh, international law legal issue, because... Um, there are certain immunities for, uh, for assets, or state assets. Uh, there is a very mild, uh, small exception whether the state assets are used for commercial purposes, but it's a very minor, um, it's a many, very minor case. That is why uh, many, some solutions are being considered. For example, if you consider that uh, if you pass from freezing to confiscation, there is the loss of property of uh, uh, confiscation entails the fact that the property is lost, so the ownership legally is lost. That is uh, that could uh, uh, could go counter to um, international uh, law principles, and of course, uh, international law is a discipline or whatever is an area of law that evolves continually, and that is also the evolution of. Uh, uh, international law could be one aspect to consider in this case, not least because uh, the Russian Confederation has a special position as a member of the Security Council, which blocks uh, effectively the working of the Security Council and is uh, um, a crime of aggression towards a neighboring country and so on. So there are some special, perhaps, uh, um, considerations to make, but it is a legal issue. So. Um, I would, I would expect that it's more about uh, uh, how to, um, you know, respect international law principle, perhaps allow them to evolve, but uh, um, not disrupt them completely. So it's, uh, it's not so much about uh, evidence, uh, an evidence-based case. Thank you, Silvia. Uh, I'm actually... I think we should be we should be reasonable with the time we have uh, already had our 90 minutes it's two hour, two o'clock and uh, colleagues need to go to meetings and so on so i would like to thank uh, first of all the authors uh, and presenters today for their contributions <clears throat> and i would like to to thank also you for having been with us today. It's also very encouraging for our research work to the Parliament. Thank also the people online. Uh, it's not the end. It's not the end of the conversation because there are a lot of issues that could have been discussed today uh, and a lot of research that could have been presented. So I encourage you to follow our app and to follow uh, our website and to take also a paper copy of that uh, 10 issues to watch and to use it all over the year. I think it's going to be useful. Thank you very much again to everyone. Have a good afternoon.